um, senior experience talks are going to be on YouTube, immortalized for eternity. So if you guys are into binge watching, right, Netflix, you can binge watch senior chemistry talks, five years worth. There, this is going to be number 76 that will be put up on YouTube. Um, and so if you just go Google uh, Lawrence Chemistry Seminar and Senior, you'll, you'll get right there. Also, uh, you're invited to the chemistry department picnic because you know a chemistry department person. Um, and so that if you guys are interested in that picnic, you can sign up down by the stock room, which is by the elevator. So you're invited to uh, that as well. And then as a reminder, we are going to have two more talks um, on Friday at 4.20 and then five, or, uh, yes, 4.20 and 5.10. So you can go to BioFest and you can hit, to, hit up two more talks right after that. So you can do a, a three for, for that. Uh, without further ado, I will now introduce the introducer, Dr. Jeff. Hi. I'm Stephen Everett. I'm the organic chemist here. I work with Anthony, uh, so it's my honor to introduce him. So Anthony comes to us from southern suburbs of Chicago, White Sacks country. Um, he, I met him as a freshman. Uh, I teach the organic chemist, organic chemistry classes here, typically for sophomores. Anthony came in and asked me, "Hey, can I take your class as a freshman?" I said, "No." And he said, "Come on." Um, I thought that was a pretty good argument, so um, I let him take it. Usually that doesn't work out. In this case, it worked out very well, and he stayed with us and took a lot more chemistry with us. Uh, he then worked in my lab last summer on the synthetic project that you're gonna hear about today. Uh, if you haven't heard a sort of synthesis talk, I think there's two ways to come at this. One is that there is a point to all this. Um, there's two points, really. One is that we need new molecules for drugs. Uh, no one thinks that we have the perfect drugs out there yet. And so being able to make new things uh, opens the playing field, opens the, this open space that we can get stuff. But also, this sort of, there's an intrinsic creativity to this work, right? So we are only kind of bounded by our imagination and what we can think about. And so a lot of this work is trying to say, you know, what could we make? Is this a cool way to new things? Um, and so I think that he really brought some creativity and problem solving to this process. So feel free to ask him any questions afterwards, um, including how many bonds carbon takes. I'm sure he can answer okay. And again, uh, after this, he is going to do uh, postgraduate work with the uh, Seattle Mariners. Um, I'm sure that they have lots of, again, interesting questions that chemists like ourselves are trained to solve, right, in general. Fair enough. So uh, without further ado, all right, thank you, Professor Devers, for that wonderful introduction. Like he said, I uh, had the honor and pleasure of doing research with him this past summer. Um, and I know some of you guys have basketball tournaments to get to, other, other of us have uh, happy hours to get to, so we'll get right into this. Um, like he said, we're, we're gonna be looking at the synthesis and trapping studies of phenethylene phi radicals. Don't be too scared by the words that you may or may not understand. Um, one, I don't completely understand them yet, and two, we're going to kind of do our best to break them down as we go along. Uh, but first, I kind of want to give a little bit of organic chemistry background here, so we're kind of all on the same page. Um, so this, we're going to see a lot of lines and sticks. They are not stick figures, but they are carbon, uh, carbon chains. And this kind of carbon chain will, will correspond to what you see here. So this atom here is just a, a carbon atom bound to three hydrogens, and then we have a carbon atom uh, double bonded to a different one, and then those three lines will represent a triple bond. Um, and one thing to note here, carbon takes four bonds. That's the first one of the first things that Professor Debert will tell you in organic. Um, and if you take a look here, this, this carbon bound to three hydrogens, and then one carbon, three plus one, you guessed it, four. Um, and then this carbon here will have the, the triple bond, and then that single bond, um, again, four bonds. Um, another uh, compound that we'll kind of see come up again and again throughout this presentation is this is what's known as a benzene ring. Uh, and again, drawing in those atoms there, we'll see, uh, we'll see that each of those carbons will have a double bond and then uh, bound to another carbon and a corresponding hydrogen uh, atom bounded, bound to it as well. Um, so now on to a couple term symbols, symbols and abbreviations for those, for those terms. The first of which is theophene, which is just an aromatic uh, ring with a sulfur in it. Again, not shown, but, oh, looks like my laser's almost died. Uh, again, not shown, but these are carbon atoms there. Uh, 
and then that's just the nomenclature for that is a theophene ring. And then the next one we'll take a look at is naphthalene. Uh, naphthalene is simply, if you remember from the previous slide, we have that one benzene ring. Naphthalene is just two benzene rings fused together. And then we have a phenyl group, uh, which is again just a benzene ring, but because chemists are lazy, they don't want to draw those in all the time, so they'll just denote it with a pH. And then we have a radical, which is a free or unbound electron, and that'll be denoted by a single dot, either above, below, or adjacent to whatever atom that radical uh, happens to be located on. And then, just to kind of try and tie it back to those, those weird words at the end of the title slide, um, we have that theophene ring, which kind of corresponds to the theno part, naphthalene, which corresponds to the naphthalene part, and then we have biradicals, and there we have it, the radical. So now we're kind of introduced to all of that uh, weird chemistry jargon that you may have not been too familiar with. Um, now, before we go on to what we actually did in the backbone of our research, um, these are a couple of, uh, of drugs that are commonly used and prescribed in the United States. And one thing to note is that they all have some kind of ring system. And more specifically, they all have a bicyclic ring system. Um, and th this is very uh, prevalent, and bi um, excuse me, bicyclic ring systems are used very frequently in biomedicinal chemistry due to their stability and versatility. And what I mean by versatility um, is that you can imagine adding different groups or different atoms, different functional groups onto each of these carbon atoms, and then therefore that those different functional groups on different positions will yield different, um, different chemical properties and different biochemical properties within the body. And now to kind of tie it back to the real world, and by real world, I, I mean money, um, these are the sales uh, as of 2017 in, in US dollars of these, of these uh, drugs. And as you can see, this is, these are not small, small numbers here. Um, and then just kind of, to kind of show the growth and the uh, size of that, the drug market and introducing new potential drugs to that drug market is imperative to, to that growth. So now into what we actually did. So the backbone of our research came out of a paper from the National Laboratory of Applied Organic Chemistry at uh, Lanzhou University in China. And what they did was they developed different routes of synthesis to conjugated anodynes. And what those are aren't super important, but what is important is that on their, their journey to synthesize those conjugated anodynes, they had a, a intermediate step that interested us. And that was, was this step here. Before we kind of talk about why this was so interesting, we'll talk about what we're gonna to refer to these compounds as. So this one on the left, we will refer to as a dipropargyl sulfide. That sulfide coming from that sulfur, sulfur atom. Propargyl, the way the carbon bonds are bound with that um, triple bond carbon in the middle of it is kind of, the nomenclature for that is propargyl, and then di, of course, because there are two. So there we have a di propargyl sulfide, and on the right, we have a biradical sulfone, that sulfone coming from the sulfur dioxide group, and the biradicals, of course, coming from those two radicals, uh, two radical free unbound electrons. So why were we interested in this step? Well, we wanted to see if we could trap these biradicals, um, and if we could trap them, we could we'd create another cycle and create that bicyclic ring system. Again, that bicyclic ring system, big in, in biomedicinal chemistry and drug development, and how that would look is like this. We would try and somehow introduce sulfur dioxide into the system, uh, help that have this second ring cyclize, and, and create that bicyclic ring compound. We'll get into the mechanism of how we did that, uh, how we tried to do that in, in a few slides here. Um, but first, kind of trying to tie it again back to those confusing words. Um, here we have that theophene ring, and we have our biradicals, and we're almost there, almost to the theonaphthalene biradical um, whole little title part there. So now, what we actually did. Um, so first, this was my first uh, research position. So what, what I had to do was kind of get my feet wet in, in synthetic chemistry. So we took um, literature reactions, so literature reactions, reactions that we knew would work, reactions that we had procedures for, and tried to, tried to recreate them, um, not just for the sake of, of recreating them, but also because we needed them to synthesize our target 
compound. So the first of which we took uh, propargyl alcohol. Again, we have that propargyl group here and that OH, uh, the nomenclature for that OH is just alcohol. And then uh, reacting that with specifically carbon tetrabromide, um, and that bro bromide ion will just uh, pretty much kick off that, that alcohol um, and then replace it there as you see. Um, now what we do with that propargyl bromide is react it with sodium sulfide and that again that sodium sulfide atom will kind of kick off that bromide and you can imagine hap that happening with two branches. So here we have our dipropargyl sulfide. Uh, then we can take that dipropargyl sulfide, react it with oxone, that sulfur atom will be oxidized twice and we'll have our dipropargyl sulfone. This next part, uh, this next reaction, the mechanism is a little trickier, so I'm going to try and break it down step by step here. Um, so then what we did was we reacted this dipropargyl sulfone with uh, a base. We actually, for the synthetic chemists in the room, we used DABCO, um, but what that is isn't, isn't super important. point is it's a very nucleophilic base. So this, this base has lone pairs, a lone pair of electrons, and it'll pretty much snatch up that H, that hydrogen, if you will, uh, from this carbon atom here and create what's called a carboanion. And that carboanion is a, is a negatively charged carbon atom. Again, now this carbon has three bonds. Like we said, carbon likes to take four bonds, so it'll, it'll try and rearrange itself so that it can, it can have four bonds again. So those, these electrons will be on the move. They'll move over to this bond, creating a double bond. Then we'll have this, the electrons from this triple bond move over to this carbon atom, creating another carboanion, um, and in the process creating another double bond, but again, only three bonds. So this, uh, these lone pair of electrons will pretty much snatch up that hydrogen that we have floating around with that base to uh, satisfy, to add that H over here. So pretty much what we did is we just moved this H over here um, through using that, that base. Uh, and then you can imagine that happening on that bottom branch as well to give us those two double bonds. So that, um, after that, we'll have something called uh, Garrett Braverman cyclization, which is from a paper that we utilize a little bit, mostly just to, to understand this mechanism. Um, and what happens here is, again, it's pretty much just an arrangement of electrons. Um, an electron from this double bond will uh, move over here along with this one to kind of close this and create that bond, and another electron will move to uh, this carbon here to create that radical, and it'll happen again on the, on the bottom there. So, um, and then really quickly, before we show how this, this cyclization finishes, uh, I'd like to point out these two atoms, or these two compounds are the same. I just changed a couple things around for the visualization of the, of the next step here. So this pH up here corresponds with this one here. Like I said, that pH just denotes that, that ring. Um, and then this pH again is still just this pH, and then we still have those radicals present. So what happens now is that these radicals, again, these radicals just kind of move around to create that bond here. A, a few other things happen, but that's, that's pretty much the gist. And then we have this three-membered ring system here um, on the right. So you'll notice that this says fast and this says slow. So what that pretty much means is this, this is in constant equilibrium. So it's, it's either like this or those, we have those free radicals. Um, but more often than not, we'll find it like this because this is a lot more stable. Free radicals, very unstable, highly reactive. So we won't find it in this conformation too often. And that's something to keep in mind as we go on here. Like I said, we're trying to trap those biradicals so trapping those when most of the time it's in this might be a little difficult. Uh, again, just to kind of tie it back to that, those weird couple words, now we have our theophene, our naphthalene, and our biradicals, and that's how we get that theonaphthalene biradicals. So, how, back to trapping the biradical and how we're gonna actually try and do it. This is the, the whole, the novel idea that we have, trying to make this new compound. So what we tried to do is we tried to introduce sulfur dioxide to the system uh, via DABSO, which for the synthetic chemists is just DABCO with a sulfur dioxide group uh, bonded to either of the nitrogens. But the, the important thing to note is that we have sulfur dioxide, introducing it, 
and we're trying to have the, the lone pair electrons of that sulfur dioxide pretty much bind to these radicals and trap them so that we get this, this biradical system, or this uh, bicyclic system. And what we want, and if we do this, what's nice about using sulfur dioxide is that sulfur dioxide is a good leaving group. And what that means is it's, it's very stable on its own. So if we get this, we can pretty much kick this off whenever we need to to access this biradical again. So, before we get into if it worked or how it worked or what have you, we have to see what we actually had after all of these reactions. And to first, what we used to characterize or identify what we had was uh, GCMS, or gas chromatography mass spectrometry. I understand most of you probably don't know what that is, so we're going to try and get everyone on the same page here with a little GCMS overview. So first things first, you inject your sample into, into some injector port and that injector port is extremely hot, causing your sample to go to the gas phase. There's the gas part of GCMS. And then as you inject it, it enters a column, and in that column, the components of your sample get separated um, based on a variety of uh, different chemical properties. The GCMS uses polarity to, to separate it, and uh, as those eluents, or as those uh, components elute from the column that'll elute at a specific time and then that time that those components elute is called the retention time of the, the component. Um, and then you can, uh, it'll, that will yield, that, that elutant will yield some kind of signal and you can plot that signal against the time, its retention time, that it exits the column. Um, and just as a little visualization, this is actually a different kind of separation, but the visualization is, is pretty similar. Um, like I said, our GCMS uses polarity. This is actually a size exclusion, uh, size exclusion chromatography. So as you can see here, we're, here's our sample with a whole bunch of different components. Um, as we move on, it kind of starts to separate, and by the end, we have them separated by size. Like I said, it will be the same principle, um, except in, in the GCMS, the instruments that we use, it will be separated by polarity. So those different those different components will exit the column by, by their polarity rather than their size. So now on to using a GCMS to help us identify what we had. Um, unfortunately, we had a little bit of a problem identifying, identifying these uh, compounds using the GCMS. Um, so first what we did is we ran our starting material, our di, uh, dipropargyl sulfone through the, through the GCMS. Um, and it yielded this plot here, not super important on its own. Uh, and then we, uh, we ran the three-membered ring system. So this was the dipartial sulfone with that base. Um, so no, no sulfur dioxide yet, not trying to trap those bioradicals quite yet. Again, not too impressive on its own, but one thing to note is these look pretty similar. Uh, and then we ran it again with the uh, sulfur, dipartial sulfone reacted with that SO2, so trying to trap those radicals, and again, it looked very similar. So really, the, the important thing here is that these all look the same. So we couldn't really get too much useful information from them. Um, and the fact that uh, this one, this, this last one, looked the same as our first one, not super concerning, not super surprising, because like I said, this is kind of our whole novel idea here. This is the new compound we're trying to make. So the fact that maybe it didn't work, not shocking. But the fact that we don't see a difference between these two was, was worrisome because this is a literature reaction. At adding this with base, that was a literature reaction, so we should see some kind of difference there. Um, so rather than just giving up, which I'm sure Professor Deborah wouldn't have let me do anyway, uh, we went to a different detection or an identification instrument, the NMR. Uh, or nuclear magnetic resonance. And again, I'm gonna try and give a brief overview here so we can all get on the, uh, on the same page. This, this instrument, super, super complicated, so don't be upset, Professor Fleshman, with how I explain it here. Um, gonna try and keep it super basic. So, uh, each nucleus has, has some spin associated with it. And that spin generates a magnetic field, and that magnetic field is, is random. Okay, but something interesting happens when you apply a external magnetic field that's fixed. So when you apply some fixed external magnetic field, it either align the nucleus with or against the external magnet. Um, and just a 
brief, a little visual on that. So here on the left, we have those nucleus, we have the random magnetic fields, and then we apply some fixed magnetic field denoted H naught. And now we have on the right our nuclei with e either aligned with or against that magnetic field. Um, and so, you, like I said, you kind of shoot this magnetic field at, the, at your sample, and then you can read the difference um, of the magnetic field as it's exiting, as it finishes going through the sample, and that difference can yield different uh, properties, uh, chemical properties, specifically properties relating to the chemical structure of, uh, of your sample. So, that in mind, here are some NMR spectra. Again, up top here we have our dipropargyl sulfone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, this spectra here is our three-membered ring system. Again, we have literature spectra for both of these because they, they're known reactions. We have literature spectra so we can match them uh, to the spectra presented in that, in that paper that we were working off of. And sure enough, they were a match. This is, these are, they looked like the spectra. We determined, okay, cool. Our reactions did work. Um, and one thing to note, one piece, a couple pieces to note specifically, um, are the presence of this peak here a little after 4.5 and 5, and the presence a little after 7.5 on for this uh, three-membered ring system, and the absence of them on this dipropargyl sulfone. Um, but what we determined was that those peaks are characteristic of that theophene ring, uh, and so the presence of those would be uh, imperative to concluding if we had that bicyclic ring system because, again, that bicyclic ring system has that theophene ring as well. So, now on to our next, our target molecule, the, the spectra for our target molecule. Uh, as you may note, we do not have those rings present here. Um, again, this, this spectra is just the dipropargyl sulfone, um, our starting material. But unfortunately, we did not see those rings present, uh, which uh, led us to conclude that we did not, in fact, have um, the, our target molecule, we were not able to synthesize it, and even and a further conclusion that we drew was that we actually just had this dipropargyl sulfone, and we had no um, we had no reaction, so we pretty much just had starting material. Again, uh, this peak here corresponds to this peak. These two spe peaks correspond to each other. Um, this peak, I believe, we just wrote off to solvent and other reagent garbage. Um, and then we have this big peak here. You can kind of see it peeking out here, just a little less, little less intense. And so we kind of just de uh, determined that we had no reaction and we just had that starting material um, in, in our sample. So that solves the problem of what we had, but it doesn't solve the problem of why the GCMS didn't work. Um, so going back to the GCMS spectra, what we concluded is that we actually have both, of, both our starting material and our, that three-membered ring system. So we concluded that our starting material is act actually corresponds to these little peaks here, and our uh, three-membered ring system corresponds to these large peaks. And remember back to the GCMS, little GCMS overview, that injector port is very hot. So whatever is going through here is very hot, and we, we concluded that uh, due to the heat this sulfur, uh, dipartial sulfone will kind of cyclize on its own. And so we'll, that's why we see this in every, every spectra, even the, the spectra without the base reaction, the base reaction happening. So unfortunately, we were not able to synthesize our target molecule. Um, but there are a couple different ways that we can try and, and do so, one of which being a different method of introducing sulfur dioxide. Like I said, we used DAB-SO, which is a solid sulfur dioxide. We can try using um, gas or liquid, uh, which are a lot harder to work with, which is kind of why we started with solid. But uh, trying a different, different method of introducing sulfur dioxide might yield more success. And another thing to try is slowing down that initial radical reaction, that, that cyclization of, of that radical. And how, what uh, might be a possible way to do that is by using a different branch atom or branch group here, rather than sulfur dioxide, using an oxygen um, or a sulfur atom in hopes to, uh, because we think that the cyclization of, of that radical is actually, um, a product of the acidity of this hydrogen, and so changing 
changing that oxygen or sulfur could possibly change the, or will change the acidity and possibly change that, that rate um, of how quickly that cyclizes. So before we kind of get out of here, I'd like to thank a few people, one of which being the WISCAMP group, which provided the funding for uh, my research grant. And uh, next, Professor Debert um, for taking me in. I didn't have anything I didn't have anything going for me that summer, and he kind of took me in and let me work in his lab. And then Professor David Hall, who had to take off, and Graham Sazma, who gave me feedback um, on my presentation. And Professor Graham was here all summer, too, so he, he helped me out as well. And then DMART for always getting me what I needed out of the stock room, even if it was just beaker, because I was too lazy to do my dishes. And of course, Lawrence University. So with that, thank you very much for coming, and uh, any questions? Introducing the sulfur dioxide is actually way back uh, here. We go here. Okay, so this is where we introduce the sulfur dioxide to the reaction, and uh, that doesn't really have anything to do with the detection of it. That's just using a different re reagent. So we used uh, a solid called DABSO, which again isn't too important, but you could try and introduce it using liquid sulfur dioxide or working in the gas phase and introducing that reagent in the gas phase. So is there a different like spectroscopy? Well, there is different spectroscopy we can use, but that wasn't really the, the problem when introducing sulfur dioxide, if that makes sense. Uh, I guess, I don't know, the detection was the problem there, not yeah. it was just the sulfur. Right, yeah, the, 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 this kind of comes like pre-detection, pre if that makes sense. This is part of the reaction, and then we kind of test if it's actually there. It's a good question. So the GCMS turns out to be a bad way to detect this, but it's my other way, like the MR, should have been a pretty decent way to Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. I don't know much about the EPR. Yeah, um, so you can use EPR to look at unpaired electrons. Yeah, essentially. So it depends on how long lived that species is, and whether you right. can, you can see it, see the electrons before you trap them. But I assume that reaction is pretty darn fast, so you would be able to. Yeah, well, the, the quick. Yeah, I think I think what would be the problem is I don't know the speed of this reaction here, right? Because then, if this if this goes to here really quickly, then we won't be able to see that. So that leads to my question, <laughs> which is: Don't you need a base to form the ketene, the uh, not the aline, the aline above? You need a base to form that, right? Yes, that is the, the what, green guy. Yeah. yeah. So, were you just assuming that the the Dabco piece of the Dabso reagent was going to act as the base and introduce that SO2, or did you have a base along? No, no, we assume that it would do both. What is DAB? Can you say it one more time? What, what is it? DAB Co. DAB, what is it? It's it's a base. I think I can draw it. DAB. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's like, oh my gosh, I really don't remember what it's called. All right, here we go. I know what it's called, so you're ahead of me. All right, so there's, oh man, this is going to be really hard. Okay, I think it's like something like that. All right, oh man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Six number three. You, you can just. I don't know what it's called though. So. Six more drink, and then you draw. There's a two-two-carbon bridge. So here, there's a bridge. 
there's a two carbon bridge between the nitrogens are connected by two carbons like three times. Oh, so it's here and then up. Oh, oops, that looks ugly. So here, maybe here. Two more carbons. So in the back, two more cards? Yep, 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 yes. One, two, yes. three, yep. yeah, there yeah. we go. And then the dab so that we used to introduce sulfur dioxide just had a uh, SO2 here and SO2 here. So my question was essentially, if you're waiting to form the biradical to take out one of the SO2s, then you don't have any base to form the, the high alkene. So you never form any biradical if you never grab on any of the SO2s. Maybe just add a little extra base on top of it and see if that initiated the reaction. I have another question for you. It's an annoying question because it's about your intro stuff, which is not your research. Uh, Why is Aleve so much less money than all those other drugs that you well, it's like one. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, it's because these are all. These are all. These are all uh, this is like over the counter. These are all prescription, I think, and they're all like name. They're all patented like, patents. Yeah. That's, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. That's a lot. What, what's crazy is that's still so high. Yeah. Right? Because there's so many substitutes. Yeah. yeah. These are, and then again, these are actually top 10 commonly used and top 10 prescribed. So, like, if you, that's another reason why those are so high. Well, the problem is that it's hard to prescribe Are there any more questions for it? <laughs>